This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. He gave me a book on art forgery. I found myself drawn to these old masters. How did these artists take paint from a palette, arrange it on a canvas? I began to unlock the secrets I was a storehouse of knowledge of how to create an illusion, present it to a experienced expert, manipulate his mind, and convince him and bring him to the inevitable conclusion that the painting is genuine. We flooded the market with my paintings, and I couldn't believe what I did. I couldn't believe it. Then the dominoes started falling, and eventually the FBI were led to my door. They uncovered a mountain of evidence against me. But they never actually got you. At this point, you've sold a lot. You've got like a million dollars in cash. You sold (laughs) one painting for 717000 Why did it go away? Why did you never get indicted? How are we having this conversation? (laughs) I guess that's the greatest story of all. To hear how Ken Perenni made millions in art forgery, dodged the mafia and the FBI, subscribe to The Jordan Harbinger Show and check out episode 282 in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. This week on the podcast, we welcome Justin Amash. Justin Amash is a former member of Congress who represented Michigan's 3rd District in the U.S. House of Representatives from January 2011 to January 2021. First elected as a Republican, Representative Amash left the Republican Party in July 2019 and later joined the Libertarian Party, becoming the highest-ranking Libertarian Party officeholder in the country. During his time in office, Representative Amash came to be particularly concerned by the harms of power centralization in Congress and increasing partisanship, and since leaving office, he has been exploring ways to combat these trends. In Congress, Representative Amash earned a reputation as one of its most transparent and accessible members, thanks to his frequent vote explanations on social media and many town halls. His legislative efforts focused heavily on congressional openness and protecting individual rights. I'm with Justin Amash, everyone. Welcome. We finally made it happen. Yeah, I mean, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. And yeah. uh, and I'm glad we're we're finally doing it. I know. I think that there is so much energy in the kind of wasteland of the center, as I call it. And I think you're a good person to have a conversation about how you productively use that energy. Yeah, well... Look, the the country's in a messed up place right now in many ways. Uh, like <laughs> society is just it's it's not where it needs to be in terms of people respecting each other and caring about each other. And I think that's a big impediment to liberty. It's in a big it's a big impediment to our uh, entire system functioning in a way that is beneficial to people, that allows people to make choices for their own lives. You know, I, mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think you can have a free society when everyone's angry and and hostile because that's when people clamor for more control of others. Mm-hmm. And we've gone through periods like this, obviously, in our history. Do you are you optimistic about seeing our way through this? How, how what is your overall feeling right now today? Are you pessimistic? Or are you- um, <laughs> I mean, you have to think short term versus long term. Long term, I think that I think long term we're in great shape. We're resilient as a country. You know, we've been through very tough times before, and I think actually, Mm -hmm. if you look at liberty, you know, just freedom of people throughout history, we are freer today than at any time in history. 
So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I wouldn't want to live 50 years ago or 100 years ago compared to today. And I think in 50 years or 100 years, we'll say the same thing. We wouldn't want to be back back in this time. So, right. (laughs) So you think the trajectory is is upward still? Yeah, I think so. Like in, in the short run, anything can happen. You know, like you can have all sorts of disruptions. You can take steps backward for brief periods of time. But yeah, I think in the long run, I. We're we're good. I mean, yeah. Just people want freedom. People people want to make decisions for their own lives, and I just mm-hmm. think that's the tra- trajectory overall. Is it, is there any possibility of a third party rising in this country and out of this kind of chaotic state that we're in at the moment? Yeah, I, I really think there is, and you know, we already have. A lot of parties, you know, I, I, there's some yeah. sense in which I use the term third party from time to time, but I don't even really like the, the framing. Um, and I, every time I say it, I'm kind of like, uh, I shouldn't have framed it that way because it, it suggests that the other parties, the old parties are like some kind of fixture and this third party, you know, in quotes is like an oddity or it shouldn't, <laughs> it shouldn't be mm-hmm. there. Uh, so I just right. like to I like to think of it as like the old parties, and then there are newer parties that mm-hmm. uh, are challenging these old parties. And I, I really think there's an opportunity in the near term, like in the next five years. In, in the long term, again, like who knows? Maybe all maybe all right. parties go away, which would be which would right. be wonderful. You know, like we didn't have to deal with <laughs> political parties at all. But in the near term, I think that a third party, and you know, a new party can uh, rise up there. I did it again, um, saying third party, but a new party can rise up and challenge the old parties. And I think that can be the libertarian party. Uh, but but mm. ultimately we have a system, our constitution is designed to produce essentially two strong parties. So mm-hmm. that there's not like a lot of stability in having multiple parties in the United States for a long for a long period of time, it can happen for a short period of time, okay. but then something gets sorted out. Uh-huh. Some party is going to go away. Right. I have so many questions because I just wonder. There's so much bullying that happens when you even discuss voting not for one of the old <laughs> parties for a new yeah. party. <laughs> you know, you get a lot of crap from people on both sides, as I think you you are probably very familiar yeah, with yourself. I get it every day. Okay, how do you handle that? And what advice do you have for people who might be in a similar position with you having conversations with people, how to best frame their own position and defend their own position? Well, you know, I think the word defend is maybe a problem. Like anytime I, like, (laughs) I've noticed as, as, someone who's a public figure, that whenever the media wanted to take a swipe at me, they would say that I was defending my position. Yeah. They, they would consistently use the word defend uh, because it it puts you on the defensive. It means that it, it implies right. that you've done something wrong and that mm-hmm. you've got to make amends and you're trying to make amends. And, um, and here it is, we're presenting it for your consumption. Here's, um, Justin Amash trying to make amends for his sins. And so right. I, I don't like the word defend, although like, like I said, we all use those kinds of words, but, but it's, <laughs> but it's, it's frequently used to put people in, um, a defensive position. And so look, right. I, I say, go and talk about what, uh, your beliefs are. And feel free. Don't be frightened by the crowds. Just say what you think. And at the end of the day, Twitter is not real life. Like (laughs) the people on Twitter are the extremes. You have the extreme right. You have the Mm -hmm. extreme left. These are mostly not individuals who represent the vast majority of Americans. And so like, don't worry about it. Uh, I I don't take things like um, Twitter... Or even a town hall, honestly. Like if I did a town hall, it's it's all self-selected. The people who show up are the people right. who are really engaged. And in politics, it's almost ironic, but the people who are most engaged are the people who are you know the most partisan and the least reasonable. Um, 
it's it's the mm-hmm. people who are least engaged who tend to be the most reasonable. Um, and right. and so it's a matter of you know reaching out to those people, getting those people to recognize you know what you're doing and what you're about and what libertarianism is about, at least from my perspective, you know, as a libertarian. Um, yeah. <laughs> no one has and any so, idea. <laughs> so to get them to understand where you're coming from, I think, I think that's important, but to get them to, um, to go out and vote and engage, that's a, that's another story. It's, it's challenging, but they're, most of them are going to go vote, but they're just, you know, they, they end up just picking one side or the other of the two old parties because that's what they're used to. Right. Yeah, I, a lot of it is, as I've always kind of termed it as this factory settings, you just pull the lever that you were like raised to pull without, you're you're kind of in a self-driving yeah. car <laughs> and you just don't, haven't had, I know that that was very nice for me for most of my life, not having to think too much about it. I just, I was raised very liberal. I, I was, I was talking about the extent to which I was in a liberal bubble I don't think I knew anyone who was pro life until I was in my thirties. <laughs> you know, I, I don't I don't think I even had a conversation with anyone. I was living in the Northeast. I just falling into the middle of the culture wars has been completely eye opening for me. Gun control was another thing where I would just I always talk about how I was at Playboy writing twenty fifteen. I kind of came out of a blackout and got caught in the crossfire. And didn't know anything about what they've been teaching in schools about internalized patriarchy. Um, <laughs> none of this stuff. I was not exposed to it. I didn't go to college. And then I started writing and I was there was a school shooting and I started spouting off about guns. And my audience pushed back because I had got a kind of libertarian conservative audience writing at Playboy. And they rightfully push back. And I step back and I'm just like, <laughs> I know nothing about guns. I don't even know. I don't know any of the gun laws in California. I don't know what you need to do to get a gun. I don't know. I don't even know how to shoot a gun. And that was really the beginning. It was like the crack where, you know, some people say it's being red pilled. But for me, it was just kind of waking up to the fact that I had not been questioning really anything that the the dominant media and my very liberal family, just the water that I was swimming in, I yeah. took it all for granted. And I think this is true with I now I hear I hear from people as I'm sure you do, who have come from, you know, both wings of the dominant parties. And it's a similar story, just maybe it's reversed if you grew up and you're in a predominantly mm-hmm. conservative uh, household. Although I think with that, with conservatism and being, you're a little bit on the de- defense in the culture. So they, I feel like have a, a different, it's a different kind of experience, but yeah, I I think that there's a lot of people who have gone through this and this is the energy that I'm trying to figure out how to capture because I think right now there is so much ideological migration happening and it does seem to be a frustration with these both major old party parties but I'm still not seeing a real uh, there's no real lightning rod in that center to kind of energize everybody. Yeah, I I know what you mean. And it's one of the reasons actually that I, I joined the Libertarian Party. When I left the Republican Party, I said, okay, I'm going to be an independent. And I think one of the problems or one of the challenges of being just an independent and not creating sort of an independent minded party, at least in the current um, climate and, you know, our our current situation in politics where you, you still have a lot of dominance of like party politics Mm -hmm. is that when you don't have that, that sort of rallying cry, that, that party entity, it's hard to get people organized and engaged. Like, right. Like it's hard to get a bunch of people who just think of themselves as non-affiliated. They're like independent to like, to get engaged in the political process. You kind of need, (laughs) you need a vehicle. And right. And that's why I view the Libertarian Party as a vehicle, because I think that libertarianism is something that cuts across all sorts of boundaries. Like, it's really about letting people uh, decide their own values, 
you know, they, they can live their life according to their own values. And we live under, obviously, we're going to have a common set of rules, depending on, you know, the particular jurisdiction, you live in a community, it has a set of rules, you live in a state, it has a set of rules. But the idea is letting people to letting people make their decisions to the maximum extent possible, their own decisions, decide what their values are. I'm not trying to force someone who, you know, believes in a certain uh, way of life to adopt my way of life. Uh, but the old parties are trying to do that. The old parties are trying mm-hmm. to force people into a box. You know, they're mm-hmm. they're saying like, if you're a Republican, you must do X and believe X, and you must show allegiance to Donald Trump or whatever. Right. If you are a Democrat, you you have to believe in you know equity, and you have to believe in critical race theory, and you have to you know like mm-hmm. there's a, there are like all sorts of parameters that they're trying to force you into. Um, and, you know, it's not in, it's not a total thing yet in either party. They haven't forced everyone into those boxes yet, but that's what they're trying to do. And that's why these parties are getting smaller. The old parties are getting smaller, right? which is opening up a huge middle that I think the Libertarian Party can capture. What does it stand for from your perspective? Because it feels like I've, I feel like libertarianism is maybe where I align with the most, probably it's where I end up, Mm -hmm. but I still don't know that I could, I have any idea what it's also seems like there's a very diverse group of ideas on within libertarianism. Yeah, there, there is. And there are some people who, you know, um, lean toward the like the anarchy anarchist side, side. <laughs> yeah. and, and I've you know I've had talks with um, Michael Malice about that, and and he agrees with me that anarchism is really a separate thing from libertarianism. You know, yeah, like, that's how it feels to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't see a huge problem if there are anarchists who you know believe that the Libertarian Party is like a useful vehicle. Um, they're along for the ride a little bit of the way, but at the <laughs> end, at the end of the day if you are working within our political system, um, the political party has to be centered on ideas that are connected to our political system. It can't Mm -hmm. be about like, let's tear the whole thing down and, and just have anarchism because that's a, that's like a totally different thing. You know, Mm -hmm. I I think a party has to be centered around working within the framework of our constitution. Mm -hmm. That doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you couldn't try to amend the constitution if you think there's an issue with it, but I, I think it just has to work within that framework um, to Mm -hmm. be a viable political party in in this country. So for me, you'd ask the question about like, what is libertarianism about or what's the libertarian party about? And I think if you look at like the libertarian party platform, it, it really comes down to protecting our rights, Mm -hmm. you know, which is, which is the purpose of government anyways, like the purpose of government is to protect our rights. And the libertarian party is about structuring our governments. And I say that plural in a way that uh, maximize the protection of rights. And, and one of the principles that most libertarians feel very strongly about is this idea of decentralization or localism. Right. And that's just the idea that um, as, as you're closer to home, there are certain decisions that should be made. You should be allowed to make decisions within that framework. And there are also structures that are very far away from you, like the federal government, and they should have greater limits on them. And people should be allowed to you know, participate in any of these structures. Um, this idea of like focusing it just on the national, like we're, we're just Americans and nothing else, or we're just whatever and nothing else I think is a mistake. So that's why mm-hmm. like there's a there's a pushback against things like nationalism. We we should let each individual decide, you know, how they're going to um, participate in this in in how they define themselves. Mhm. What did you learn the most from your time in I don't know, the theater of it? It fe- it feels very much to me from afar like it's all theater. And Mm -hmm. I know you've probably said this on Malice. I think somebody mentioned you said a similar thing. That's how it feels to me. It feels very much like I'm in the Hunger Games. And (laughs) off in the Capitol, you you know, you have all of these people who are like, I wonder what the poor are doing today. Let's make them fight. What did you learn the most? What, What was the most positive thing you learned? And what was something that 
you found maybe you have to made you more cynical or or dispirited or hopeless. <laughs> so what was a what was a positive thing about it? Yeah, um, what did you well, what would <laughs> was there anything? <laughs> I mean it's it's hard to say like okay, I you know, I I brought this up before and I don't know if it's a positive or uh, like a negative. It depends on <laughs> it depends on how you want to view it. <laughs> I think maybe um, some people I've told it to have thought of it as slightly positive because they're, they're maybe more cynical about it. But I I don't think most of the people who are in Washington are actively trying to harm people at home. I just think they mostly don't care. Wow. In other words. Like there's this vision of, you know, everyone's out there, like the most cynical vision is they're all like out to get you yeah. and they're all corrupt and they're, you know, there's like some kind of big collusion between all of them to try to, I don't know, harm people either on, you know, all people or people on the other side all to like get ahead. But I would say that most of them are just... um Self-serving. You know, they got in. They got in it for the right reasons, but they're just like not that strong. Yeah, like they're 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 weak people. Yeah, and when a leader comes by and says, "This is what we're doing," they think to themselves, "Well, like I don't know much. This guy's the leader. I should do what he says because I need to stay in Congress because I'm doing good things." This is how they think. Who's you know? the leader, though? If a leader, like like Kevin McCarthy okay. or Nancy Pelosi, yeah. Like some someone at the top says, "This is what we're doing," and um, or it could be you know Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It right. could be anyone, but someone who's like in a position of real influence within the party says, "This is what we need to do." And a lot of these people are just like they're not strong willed. It's not a matter of like that they're 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 not malevolent people. They're just they're just weak, right? And they they just crumble. They they don't know how to react, and so they're like, "Look, I, I, I want to be here because I can make a difference." And and you know, people will say nice things about me, and when I go home, they'll clap for me, and <laughs> I'll be introduced as honorable so and so. And so they kind of like that, and they think they're doing the right stuff, and they're just not that strong willed, and they have no interest in really upending the system because it's it's like overwhelming to them, right? Right? They're like. They're like, I'm one person. What am I going to do to to really fix this thing? So they just they just accept it. They just say like, this is it. It's almost like when I was there, I had a different job. Like I viewed I viewed my job in a much more like sort of, I guess macro way. Like I was thinking about the big picture. Mm -hmm. Like what is what is going on with our system of government? How can we? how can we maximize liberty for the people? Like what are the, like, what are the structures and, and how should the rules be, you know, structured? Mm -hmm. And, and I was thinking about those things and other people were thinking about like, uh, boy, I hope Kevin McCarthy is not mad at me for right, this. Or right. like I, you know, some business in my community said they want that and I've got to like really work to provide them that thing. Right. So it's, it's almost like task based for them. Like it's like transactional. Right. They just go from like one transaction to another. Oh, like they want me to do this today. I'll do that. There's no big picture view of the whole thing. It's not, they're not thinking to themselves like, boy, if I like just vote in a principled way, like I can really revive our system of government and make it flourish and ensure that liberty is maximized for the greatest number of people. Like they're not thinking about things like that. What about people like the freshman and I guess, squad, I, sorry. you know? Yeah. And I guess that's a positive, maybe like how I describe like that they're not, it's not like all, it could be a positive or a negative, depending on how you're looking at it. Like right. they're not, yeah, they're not all nefarious. It's like not all some kind of nefarious scheme by them. Yeah. They're just kind of like bumbling along. Right. Right. It, it's, it's always like, that's the simplest answer is incompetence and, and kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not just weak, usually... weakness, general weakness. Yeah. But then you see some of these younger freshmen, you know, the I would say like AOC and the squad, they seem to be pushing back and having a a bigger vision from from my perspective. So do you think that there's there are some of the younger people coming in who have more of a long view of their role? Yeah, I think 
I think that's right. You know, like I, I as much as I might criticize some of the new progressives on um, policies, you know, like I disagree with them on a whole host of policies. I think that they at least have a bigger vision, many of them, not all of them, but well, many is too big a word. Okay. I'm talking about like maybe a handful of people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I want to, I want to retract many, but, but like a handful of them have a broader vision. And I think that that's helpful. Like I take AOC. Okay. People can say what they want about her and her policies. And uh, a lot of people take shots at her. But I've actually worked with her on the House floor, and she's taken principled stands that most others are not taking. Like, mm. there will be times when Democratic leadership is saying, we have to do this, and she will vote the other way. Mm. And you can say what you want. Um, you can argue with her reasons and say, well, she's voting the right way for the wrong reasons or whatever. It, but she's willing to challenge the system. And um, and she's brought in a, like a, a good combination of she has political skill, um, obviously some charisma and like an ability to to reach people, uh, along with independence and being strong willed. Like mm -hmm. she has like strong personal will to to do mm -hmm. what she thinks is right. I think that's great. Even if I disagree with her, I would much rather have a Congress filled with people like that on the Republican side and the Democratic side, and hopefully in the future, libertarians and independents and, and others, I'd much rather have a Congress like that where we all disagree with each other in so many big ways, but at least we have views. At right. least we have principles. At least people are saying what they really believe and they're not cowering in the face of adversity. Like, um, oh, the, the leader might not take me to dinner or they're going uh. to... They're going to pull my campaign contributions if I don't do the right thing, like, and stick with them, you know, the right thing in quotes. So, so like, I, I'm happy to see this kind of thing. And I want to work with people like that in Congress. Right. People the way who, you describe it really yeah. is Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> as, yeah, as, I mean, it is. Called. Yeah. It really, it's, I just had a conversation yesterday and we were talking about how at what I thought, you know, my, I always joke like capitalism always wins and the, as Hollywood loses, just sheds viewers with all of the wokeness. I'm like, Oh no, it really is just a vanity project. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that they even care about making money. And it, it is really all people who are scared because nobody's actually pushing back and speaking out against the few people in power who are who are saying this is the track we're taking in Hollywood now. It is so much like that. And and it's it is kind of like Hollywood in the respect that you know you described it. There's a lot of people in Hollywood just like a lot of people in Congress who are just kind of weak. They're, they're not scared. interested in, they're scared. They're not interested in pushing back. And then there are these people at the top the the sort of leaders of industry and in congress that's like nancy pelosi and kevin mccarthy and chuck schumer and mitch mcconnell they kind of like direct things and kind of um set the tone for what's going on and then there's about maybe 10 to 20 percent of members of congress who are sort of they're just they're entertainers in the real sense they just they are um playing it up for the tv it's it's primarily performance art I've had conversations with them where they tell me things flat out. Like I, I can tell you, there are some people who are, for example, Donald Trump's most ardent supporters on the right. And in private, they will say to you, like, it's all an act. I have to pretend because it, it benefits me. It keeps me right. you know, in power and allows me to have more influence. And ultimately I think make more money is how they view it too. So, so they, there but are people like that. And yeah. that's about 10 to 20%. The rest of the people, like I said, are just kind of weak and following the leader. But but there are people like that too. Yeah, there, that leads me to one of the questions that I had in my community that I thought was interesting. Why do p representatives feel they should vote their conscience instead of what their constituents want? Like that, that would, I think in the case of Trump, a lot of these people, for example, they would say, oh, even if I don't, because I see this again in Hollywood, I'm like, do these people even believe what they're saying? I, I actually don't think they do when they come out and make some 
woke statement or something that just seems so and I'm not even sure they believe what's coming out of their mouth. And this I feel the same way about a lot of politicians, particularly what you're describing, where it's this public persona and privately they're like, ah, he's crazy and I, I don't agree with them. But is it in some part because it's what they feel their constituents voted for them to do or say? Yeah, there it in some cases it is like that. Um you know, if you represent a predominantly Republican or Democratic district and and they're doing polling on it and it says, for example, in the Republican district, Donald Trump is popular, they're thinking, well, I'll stick with Trump. Like, I you know I, I have my own principles, but Trump is popular. So like whatever Trump does is what I'm going to do. And Dem- right. Democrats have the same issue where they, they have the same sort of like they pull the district and they figure out what's popular. And if if that's what works, that's what they do. And so you have like um, a lot of performance that comes from that. Like I'm a, I view my role totally differently. My view is, look, people elect me to use my judgment. They're not, it's not mm-hmm. a direct democracy. They're not electing me to take a poll on everything, nor would a, <laughs> nor would a poll mean anything. Like if I polled, right. we're dealing with thousands of votes over like a few years I couldn't possibly poll on each vote, nor mm-hmm. would nor would my constituents even know what's in the legislation. They're not reading the legislation. That's my job. You know, they, right. when you take a headline of what a bill is about, it has almost nothing to do with the bill. The bill, the headline will right. be the, like the title will say something about helping children. And then the bill will be something totally different. So yeah, that seems like a problem. <laughs> so you can't ba- you can't base it on polling. It would be crazy to to operate that way. Um, but a lot of people do base it on polling, and it goes from like macro sort of things like you know do the my constituents support Don- support Donald Trump to more to smaller scale things like a particular piece of legislation. Mm-hmm. Why are the bills like the spending bills so huge? Why like <laughs> to, one million pages to with everybody yeah. cramming something in? It, is there a way to make it so that it just seems like you'll when I even try and start to see these bills, it's like every con- other countries. I'm like, isn't this supposed to be about just helping Americans in a pandemic? What? How do you rein that in? Yeah. Is there any way? Yeah, the the last spending bill that I had in Congress that that we voted on, and I voted no, of course was I think 5,600 pages. And I don't know, they gave us, I can't remember how long they gave us to read it, but it was a really short period of time. Um, yeah. You know, the, some of these spending bills, I, I remember one where they gave us half an hour. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> They're like the terms and conditions of like, like Apple, yeah. you know, you're like, they just accept, like, it feels like you're just gonna, it was like, but this, I feel like too, comes with when they know how people are going to vote. If you're just voting along party lines. Yeah. They, they're like, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, several hundred billion or tri- oh, we'll give you, I don't know what he, has three, is two hours good enough. Like what, <laughs> as though, as though anyone would make any decision like that in their ordinary life. Like, like if you right. were like buying a house or any transaction, like I, I probably, you know, have more time to think about what groceries I need than some of these bills. I like, when you when they give you half an hour, I might spend more time thinking about like what is my grocery list for the day. So, like right. it's it, it's not okay, but they do it to control. Like the the people at the top, the leaders, they want to control the process. They want to minimize um, scrutiny to the extent possible. They know that once it's almost like when someone gets one of their like they capture someone and then they get to, them to participate in their evil deeds. Um, so that they feel like they're a right. part of it. They they want you to vote yes on that thing really quickly and then you own it. And then it's too late. Right. Now you're one of them. You you can't backtrack now. I'm sorry, like Congressman so-and-so, you voted yes and you can't, like, there's no going back. And then when the next bill comes up, they're like, well, you already voted yes on that other one. So like, you're one of us now, you know, you just, just stick with us right. and we'll, we'll help you. If you go against us, they say, well, you already voted the wrong way in the previous one. And now you're going to go against us. So now you lose your crowd at the people at home who want you to do the other thing. Plus you're going to lose us. So there's a sort of, um, you know, they're trying to control people to the extent possible and giving you as little time to read as possible is one way to control. And increasingly what happens in Congress is there's like one 
big bill at the end, especially with, when it comes to spending. And and they're even cramming in things that are non-spending related, but they're just like, they're creating like this one bill to rule them all that happens at the end of each each year. And then they just stick everything or at the end of each term, they stick everything in that one bill. And then that's it. Like you take one vote and imagine when it's, <laughs> when it's one vote, that's like the direction where it's so when it's dumb. one vote, it's very hard to vote no, because they they're like, well, you're going to vote no on all this good stuff. And then we're going to run right. ads or like your opponents will run ads to criticize you um, for all the all the stuff you, you know, you voted against. It just seems <clears throat> crazy. I don't even know how it's allowed. It doesn't seem it, it's like you said, you take a longer time to decide if you're buying a house or you're making these decisions. But you're not just it's like if you were going to buy a house and a car, and then they're cramming in a car mm-hmm. payment. And also, by the way, here's all the things you're going right, to you're going to make a charitable contribution. And if you say, <laughs> right. no, you're going to say no to the starving children. And also, by the way, we're going to cram in some ideology, <laughs> yeah. you know, like it's, it's, I don't understand how, how do you fix this process? Because it seems like one of the biggest problems, or at least in my view, obstacles to just transparency, you know, for all the bullshit talk about transparency that I hear from politicians, this is the least transparent process. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I I think you fix it through what you're doing, and um, through what a lot of people are doing, bringing attention to it. You know, mm. one of one of my missions outside of Congress is to shed light on this, so that mm. so that Congress can function properly again, so that our government can function in a way that is conducive to protecting rights and not the current system where it's more of a like command and control. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, I'm spending time doing that, going on podcasts, talking to people, Mm -hmm. and it's only going to happen from outside. It's not going to happen from within. There's not going to be like, I was there for long enough to, to confidently recognize that there was not going to be a revolution from within. Right. Because (laughs) I, I tried to, to start some of those revolutions. Like I formed the house freedom caucus. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I tried to change things from within and every effort fell apart or ultimately turned on itself. Um, I think the Freedom Caucus in many respects doesn't at all resemble, you know, what we originally intended it to be, which was, right. uh, which was, it was a group to open up the process. That was why right. it existed, not to rally for one party or another or for one president or another. So, all these efforts have failed. I don't think it's going to happen from within. People feel, again, helpless from within. It's not until people on the outside say enough is enough that it will change. And the real thing that I want people to focus on, people at home, is decentralization. Stop mm-hmm. concentrating power in the Speaker of the House and in these um, party leaders. Right. Uh, require like if if you're voting for someone require them to answer about how they're going to deal with leadership how they're going to deal with um the the process of running a government it's not just about like mm-hmm. the substance like uh, where do you stand on abortion or gun rights or whatever you have to talk about the process of government where do you stand on right. members of congress being able to read legislation where do you stand on members right. of congress being able to amend legislation um, you know, it, those kind of things are are honestly more important than the substance because the substance flows from these things. If you can, if someone controls the process, like someone at the top, and has a really um, horrendous process, a very you know top down <laughs> process, it doesn't matter what your substantive views are. You're just not getting them heard. Like I can be the most, right. I can be like the you know the the reincarnation of F.A. Hayek, you know, and come into Congress <laughs> and say like we're going to do all these things, but I if I can't get a vote on anything. Like, what's the point? Like, there's it, it's right. all it's all lost. So so focus on process. Right. I think this is an area though where people also feel helpless outside. You know, Mm -hmm. you're saying inside there's this feeling of helplessness. 
how how do you rein in the power of these speakers like Nancy Pelosi? Is, is something like term limits uh, uh, effective? Is this a how do you? <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I think that um, uh, term limits for a speaker wouldn't be a bad idea. You probably have to have a constitutional amendment to do that. When I think about it, so I, I think something like that would be a um, might be a good idea just to get people like rotating through. I'm for term limits on members of Congress generally. It's not like some kind of fix all. It's not going to, but it will marginally improve things. You know, maybe, maybe mm-hmm. it's like, a, you know, it's like a 10% or 20% improvement to the current system. It's not going to, it's not a hundred percent improvement, but it's like a, it's a small improvement. What do you, what do you think are the things you could do that would create the most improvement? The The most improvement would happen through, like just general decentralization, allowing uh, amendments to be offered on the House floor, that doesn't happen anymore. And and I, you mm-hmm. know, I can speak about the Senate too, but I'm not an expert in the Senate. Um, mm-hmm. Senate rules are a little bit different. They have the same sort of centralization problem in the Senate, but it's not as serious at this point uh, because they have fewer people. They have only a hundred, right. and some of the traditions of the Senate are a little more conducive to allowing individual decision-making to break away from the leadership, but it, it is also becoming highly centralized. So like, while I say mm-hmm. that, it's also still highly centralized, but nothing like the House. The House is like a complete top-down mess. There's, <laughs> there, there hasn't been an amendment offered freely on the House floor in the House of Representatives since May 2016. Wow. So, th- I mean, I don't know why this doesn't horrify more people, but through throughout the, you know, 200 and something years that we've had uh, Congress, it was always the case that members of Congress, particularly on appropriations legislation, these spending bills, could come to the House right. floor and offer their ideas. And it didn't matter what the Speaker of the House thought or anyone else thought. They could get that vote if it was if it was germane, if it was relevant to the to the bill at hand. They could get that vote on the House floor, and if they could convince enough of their colleagues to vote for it, that was going to become a part of the bill. And that was that. Right. Since 2016, it's gotten to the point where you can't do that anymore at all. There are no opportunities to offer amendments on the House floor. You can still offer amendments to the Rules Committee. But the rules committee is controlled by the speaker. And if they don't like your amendment for any reason, if the speaker is like, I just, I don't want to add that to the bill or whatever, your amendment's out. There doesn't have to be a real reason for it. They'll just say your amendment's gone. So, uh, you know, structurally, this is a big problem because now we we don't have any discovery in Congress anymore. There's no, there's no discovering what is the outcome that's preferred by the representatives of the people. It's just what is dictated by the leadership team. And if everything is basically take it or leave it, it's all take it or leave it legislation now. Right. Right. Ugh. And you give me, and if yeah, you give me take that, it or leave it, I'm going to leave it most of the time. You know, like it's, there's right, going to be a lot right. of times where I just, I just go and leave it because I'm, it's not okay. Right. It just, it seems like not enough people understand these intricacies of the process, myself included. I feel like even when you talk about the rules committee, I'm like, what the hell is the rules committee? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what is this and what do they do? And why do I feel like such an idiot who does not understand how my government functions because it seems so complicated? Yeah. But this is where um, we need independent media. You know, the media are right. The media have such an agenda now like the the main media outlets on the left and the right have such an agenda that mm-hmm. none of this gets scrutinized like you right. never know that the process is broken like you you can't watch CNN and figure out that the speaker of the house basically operates like a dictator like it just doesn't right that's because that's how right it, sounds. it doesn't it's not <laughs> yeah. i mean it, we honestly have an oligarchy i've called it also a triumvirate like there are three people mm-hmm. who basically run the federal government, and that's that. And CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, they're they're not acknowledging that. They don't they continue mm-hmm. to pretend that the problem is the other side is bad. Mm-hmm. Rather than pointing out mm-hmm. that there is a structural problem that cuts across the sides. It's not like it's not a Republican problem or a Democratic problem. Each side of the aisle 
has has used their power in this way. When they get power, they've used it in dictatorial fashion, um, whether it's Paul Ryan or Nancy Pelosi. And it's it's sad mm-hmm. for me to say that John Boehner, who I you know tried to oust, ended up being the best speaker that I had as a as a representative, and he was terrible. Like if he was terrible. And he's he's thoroughly disingenuous, like you know, in what he says. But he was the best speaker we had, and that was because mm-hmm. at least he occasionally let us have amendments on the House floor. It wasn't as as good as it should have been, but it happened occasionally. It doesn't happen at all anymore. Wow, there seems like there's so much infrastructure to for the, like the old parties, mm-hmm. you know, and even just in terms of talking about how do you get that groundswell movement of people to rally around and start talking? I think I see it. I see tons of fragmentation and independent media, independent journalists. Again, (laughs) how do you, how do you collect all of that energy and use it to create? I think there needs to be, there's the, obviously the libertarian party has infrastructure. It can get on ballots. It, has there there's it's easier than if you were just gonna you know go rogue but how do you see that happening in the next five years in particular you know i guess i'm wondering what can the individual do what can i do i it's like you said it's very hard to be like we stand for nothing (laughs) right yeah (laughs) like we yeah like it has hate everything Right. It has to be, I mean, it has to be a multifaceted approach. And one thing I'd encourage people to do is join the Libertarian Party. You know, we're we're trying to organize people who are like-minded about this stuff. What your substantive views are on issue after issue, they're not as important to me as what do you think about the general purpose of government? Mm-hmm. Is it about protecting people's rights? And how are we going to structure government? Whether that's like, you know, Federalism, like, you know, what powers the federal go- does the federal government have versus state versus local or localism is an extension of that of that concept of federalism or division of powers within the government, like legislative, executive and judicial and within even a, a particular um, house like the House of Representatives, how the power is structured. I think those kinds of issues, people who care about that stuff, who just want our system to work as it's supposed to work Mm -hmm. which is like to have a decentralized system that's what that's what the framers created they gave us a decentralized system on purpose to protect rights that's why this decentralized system is there so people who care about that stuff please join the libertarian party and let's move let's move toward that decentralized system that we're supposed to have which will protect people's rights And increase people's happiness. And this is true whether you're on the left or the right, like whether you consider yourself kind of toward the left or toward the right, it doesn't matter or or dead in the center. You can maximize your happiness by having a more decentralized system. I think that's really important. So that's like just an organizational thing. Right. As for um, like, how do we persuade more people to come along? I think that's going to be libertarians or like-minded people, independent people have to start I have to start building out some infrastructure like right. non nonprofits and like media. Um, we're going to have to build out some infrastructure to talk about these things and, uh, and try to bring people on board because at the end of the day, all of our efforts don't mean anything if we can't get people to like see that, Oh yeah, this is the problem. You know, I, I think most people like subconsciously understand that there's this problem here. Government's not working like it's supposed to, right. but they're not, they're not sure exactly what it is. So like getting them to identify this as the problem, centralization in government as the problem, I think is, is key. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's how, how is this system that was created that led us here <laughs> going to solve <laughs> this problem? You know, it seems like the, the system, the framers gave us, which is in theory, supposed to keep things decentralized and working, it still somehow got us to this place. So where did we go wrong and how Mm -hmm. do we fix that? Well, I think that um, you can't separate 
technological advancement from like what has happened with with our government. Interesting. So I would say that mo- in modern times, you have the greatest case for decentralization because because of technology, because people can get information so rapidly, you actually have the least need for these overarching, large controlling structures. It's mm-hmm. actually it's actually earlier in time when information was very hard to come by, like across right. <laughs> pretty significant distances, that there seems to be more of a need to like, for, for example, you could make a stronger case for powerful regulatory agencies in a period when information did not flow freely. Right. Right. Because if you don't like, if you don't really know anything about anything, like there's no Twitter where you can learn like, oh, you know, they're poisoning people at this plant or whatever. Right. You know, like if you right. can't figure that stuff out, now there's there's a, a greater argument for more control. If you don't know what your particular representative's viewpoints are, oh well now there's a greater argument for strong political parties and sort of a, a more of like um you know, shortcuts. Like, right. well, if you're uh, generally believe these kind of things, vote Republican um, or vote Democrat or whatever, like there, there's a greater need for shortcuts. There are, there, there's less need in modern times for these sorts of overarching controlling structures. And mm-hmm. there's a greater case for decentralization today mm-hmm. than ever before mm-hmm. because information flows so freely. So I would say, well, yes, our constitution, you, some could say, um, like maybe Michael Malice might say, you know, it brought us to this place and like we have the government we sort of deserve based on, you know, what, what would we expect with this constitution? That's what it brought <laughs> us, right? But what I would say is things have changed so dramatically in the past just couple decades yeah. that, and we got to this bad place. And now if we can just reel it back and get back to a place of decentralization, we might find a very like happy place. Um, Like Americans might find a very happy place and they might say like, we never want to go back to that centralized crap ever again. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Like we have a good place. Whereas before maybe they could make some arguments for it based on the, the lack of, um, you know, information flow. Yeah. Although it feels like every, the government's getting bigger. (laughs) (laughs) It's look, it's, it's getting bigger in many ways. And um, in some ways it's, it's more restrained. I mean, like, like it, it depends on the context, right? Right. Like gay people couldn't marry 20 years ago. Right, so right. like there were massive rights violations being undertaken by states and the federal government just within like the, you know, the 20th century that just don't exist today to the, to the same degree. Right. So in some ways, the state is getting bigger. There's definitely more spending happening. There's definitely more. Um, there's more uh, centralized government in the sense that, like, more is being done by the federal government at the expense of state and local. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, the case today is greater for decentralization than ever than ever before. Look, look at our ability to tackle things like discrimination. It's easier than ever before. Because we have video of everything, because we right. have we have Twitter, and like if some company is racist, you just go on Twitter and you say like, oh, they they like fired me for this terrible reason, or right. or like I you know I wanted to buy something at this store, but they wouldn't let me because they they don't like they don't respect me or they don't like my values or whatever. You can just go tweet about it, and it can have a massive effect on on that organization. So there's a stronger case today for decentralization. Although in that in that scope, I think now we're looking at centralized power among a few tech companies, mm-hmm. and they are deciding who can and can't say things. And I do think this is this exact thing that you're discussing is why that is so problematic with the tech companies, because if it is the way to more liberty and having more individual happiness, then they're I understand as a libertarian, you know, the company's right to do what they want, but as these companies do get bigger and this is the kind of town town hall where individuals are going, this intersection of 
things as part of the problem as much as it's part of the solution. And I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I myself, I'm not always sure how I feel about these things. I find it, it's been a fascinating thing for me to research because I tend to go back and forth and all over the place. And I, tr I feel like th that free markets will create solutions to these problems, I hope. But then I also see deplatforming and all of, all of these things are interesting. They're definitely testing the limits of this, the concepts of, you know, free speech and who has the monopoly on these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> who gets to control it? And I, I share um, your concerns about technology. Like I, I used to talk about how prior to the internet, it wouldn't have been possible for someone like me to get elected to Congress, someone who's mm -hmm. very libertarian and, you know, is not the typical mold. Like I, you know, I was, I was like a pretty young, when I, when I first ran for office, I was in my twenties and, you know, not your stereotypical Republican. So I, I don't think I could have won without technology. At the same time, I see what goes on on social media and like, I'm like, boy, technology has really like <laughs> made life a nightmare in so many ways. And I, in so many not. Yeah, it's that's right. A it's a double-edged sword. sword. But I think, I really think that technology itself will solve a lot of these problems. Like mm -hmm. the, when I was growing up, you talk about things like AOL or Yahoo and it was like, oh yeah, like these things are so dominant and... <laughs> There, can you believe the power you know America Online has? Um, and can you, you know, like so? Did they talk like yes, that? Yes, of course. Yeah, because you had to you had to use it to sign in. Everyone like remembers right. the whole dial up thing, and like you had to. I think I still yeah, have like, my you had to, address. Yeah, they'd send you these CDs in the mail. Remember, we'd get like yeah, oh like, yeah, CDs in the mail. I, I'm, I'm sure like the, the kids don't know about this, but like they'd send the CDs, and like you'd have to. You put in your computer and like now like you you are AOL like you're one with AOL, so right. So look, there are companies that seemed like they were dominant and they sort of fell apart. I think the same thing can happen here, but more importantly, right. I don't think it's just about like companies replacing companies. I think that's that does happen and will happen where new companies arise. But I actually think that there is a market for decentralized social media for decentralized media generally. Um, there's yeah, a, there's definitely. a market for decentralization and that right. that market will produce innovations that allow right. you to speak your mind more freely and be heard without the constraints, without, you know, Twitter or Facebook or anyone else telling you, you can't say that. So I, right. I don't worry about it the same way other people do. I think that if you, and I'm not saying it's not a problem. I think it is a problem currently that, that there are a few companies that are, you know, controlling a lot of the, um, social media content. I think that is a problem, but I don't I don't worry about it not being resolved. I, I do believe it will be resolved. And I don't think that the right way to resolve it is to use the heavy hand of government. I don't think the right way- Yeah, I agree. I don't think the right way is to have the government come in and say like, you must allow people to say these things or you cannot allow people right. to say, like, because each side has its own take on this, right? Like the, the Republicans right. are like, you must allow anyone to say anything, no matter like what, no matter what the context. So like, it could be like a, like a, you know, a church forum or something. And then like, yeah, the church can't delete like comments that are, you know, totally out of bounds or whatever. Mm. They, they're not thinking through the unintended consequences of all this, right? Like there mm. is a reason mm. for moderation and, and, right. and even content, you know, specific moderation by companies. There's a reason for that. Like, People actually do typically want stuff like that, even though they pretend like, oh, no, we don't want any moderation whatsoever. And then the Democrats take it the other way, like in a very dangerous direction, like, no, we need we need companies to be socially responsible and we want them to take down anything that is like questioning, you know, our worldview. So like, right, so like you have right. the opposite problem. So I'm worried about t like getting the government involved, I think, opens up a Pandora's box. I'm I don't. The government has taken a fairly light touch on internet regulation over the years. I think that's been a good thing for free speech. I think as soon as the government starts taking a, a more heavy-handed role, you're going to get things like where 
Facebook or and Twitter become more permanent fixtures, like it will stop. It will actually start to prevent competition. Right. It, it, you'll create like this this new like ethos that these are like the national forums and like the other ones right, are not. Right, Anything right. else coming up is not. And so like it, it almost like has a self fulfilling uh, aspect to it where. You, you you enshrine them almost like in law, almost like how a lot of you know you see tel- right, like yeah utilities. utility companies yeah, and I don't want to yep. I don't want to see yep. that I don't want to see Facebook become a utility. Yeah. There's a whole conspiracy theory that I've read that this is actually what they want and are pushing for because they actually want regulation because it then kind of assures that they become a utility of course, and then yeah. now they're we never it, yeah they have no if you have a really heavy handed regulation. The big companies that exist now benefit from it. They they basically right. get they they're permanently enshrined. They become like, you know, mm-hmm. well, nothing's totally permanent, but they become pretty strongly fixed, and and then it's hard to knock them out. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely don't <laughs> trust the government with really anything. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't see even just being in California. I'm like, we have one of the biggest governments in in uh, all of the states, probably the biggest, and it's a, a dis- it's like a shit show. I just don't. I don't really know. I feel a lot of the time like Cardi B, like, where's my money going? We're highly taxed. And again, this is an area where I feel like there's zero transparency. You like, I should be able to audit. Yeah. <laughs> have you thought about moving? Uh, you know, there's all this like Joe Rogan moved to Austin and you have like all these. I know, but I have thought about it I, for reasons that are outside of my control. It's a long story, but basically we can't yeah. move right now. So for probably at least two years. I, I don't, as much as I'd like to, but, and this is one of the great things about America is that I can, but I was reading a whole thing. I've looked at Austin <laughs> and it's, I don't feel like moving to a little LA that has crappier weather and even worse traffic because they yeah. grew too fast. You know, it, it I'm not I sure know, I that feel like, I'm. I feel like everyone I know, like, I don't know, or everyone I keep hearing about is moving there. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, everybody, everyone's, there's a lot of energy there. And I think that there's something about that, the quality of that energy is very libertarian. And I think it is in alignment with a lot of my values and what I, um, there's a lot of political homelessness and people who are feeling kind of disenfranchised by all of it. And it's in the center mm-hmm. of the country somewhat, not the dead center, but yeah, so there's, there's something a nice metaphor there and I've thought about it, but right now it's like too much of a boom and I wouldn't, it it just, the prices even to rent and, and I'm not in a position to buy right now are just crazy. And I've been priced out of being able to buy because it's the boom right now and housing is so bananas everywhere, everywhere. I mean, even still in California, it's my friend bought a house and there were eight people who were bidding wow. for it. So it, even though a lot of people are leaving California, it's opening up places on the market that other people haven't been able to even yeah, find. And you do worry, so, you do worry as yeah, people leave California that they bring the, whatever was broken about California to other places yeah. that they're like... <laughs> Oh, I mean, we were just covering this on Dumpster Fire, how Texas picked up two seats and California lost one for the first Mm -hmm. time in history. And it is, I was like, I promise you one of Texas's seats is California's. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's like they just moved to Texas. And you do, I do worry that a lot of the people who are fleeing are not understanding what they're fleeing or why. This is, you know, they, they think like, oh, things are bad. And, and these are people who have money and resources, mm-hmm. you know, a lot, a lot of money and resources. And they're living in places like San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, New York, where they can get a lot for their money it, for, for not that, co- you know, mm-hmm. comparatively for them, it's nothing. And Florida's seen the same kind of boom. And it just, I'm not sure... It's interesting to me because what happens to these cities in the in kind of the wake of this and what happens to these areas that were once affordable, they won't be that affordable for long. You know, they're already driving the prices. I think there was an article that came out today that houses are up 18% Jeez. in Austin. 
Yeah. And what is it? I mean, it's got to be, it's it's probably approaching top five biggest cities in the country. Like it's, it's moving up fast, right? I mean, I don't know. I think it's in the top 10. Really? No. Yeah. Really? God, it was, it was only like a million people not that long ago. It was like Portland. It was the (laughs) site. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I I just, I, I understand that I can, I, and I don't, I think if I stay, I, I have to come into acceptance and I don't want to spend years complaining about things that I just have to accept to a certain extent and maybe try and change what I can, but I have no interest in partaking yeah. in politics. That's what I want. I'm more interested in getting people excited to to be an independent or be a third party or whatever you want to call it, a libertarian or something where we can break that binary a little bit and hopefully bring things back to being more decentralized, like you said, because I'm not, I just worry that people, what worries me the most right now is the disillusionment with everything. We have a credibility crisis and we have a disillusionment crisis in America they're disillusioned with their government. They're disillusioned with any kind of experts. They're dis- disillusioned with the media. There's zero credibility. Who who has credibility? Name one institution that remains at the end of this. And out of that can come chaos, anarchy, and even more tribalism. Or I believe something really beautiful and a rebirth and people becoming more educated about the process, not just dialing it in, voting on their factory settings, taking, it does seem like people are more engaged, especially young people who I'm, I'm Gen X. Mm-hmm. Like we were Gen very X, dude, apathetic the best about all of it. <laughs> yes, the best. And, but we were kind of like, whatever, never mind. You know, that, that was my, and, and so I think a lot of people have been dragged off of the sidelines of not, of not having to care by the culture wars, you know, getting kicked out of mommy groups for wrong think and getting kicked out of friend groups because they said something about Trump. So I think that people who might otherwise be just checked out have been unwillingly mm-hmm. dragged into into this mess. It's for me that just figuring out how to weirdly centralized it's not centralized yeah. but yeah, how do you right. gather the power but let's <laughs> like, say organized you're talking organized. about centralization <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes how do i organize all of this energy and use it because it seems still to yeah. be very I mean, scattered well first i i looked up austin is the in 2019 it was the 11th biggest city in the country um, but it's probably top ten okay. by now. It's growing. It's growing fast. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you're right. So especially after the pandemic, you know, you see a lot of a lot of movement. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's there is a lot of energy out there, and it's possible that we have to go through some really bad times before we get to the good times. Like I don't know that it's. I don't know <laughs> that it's like. Says this. I just talked to Jonathan not Haidt necessarily... and he said the same thing. Everyone's like, "Well, it's gonna get worse before it gets better." <laughs> <laughs> this, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive. Like it's not like one or the other. Like is it going to get better or get worse? And that's how it stays. Like I think it could get worse for a while and then get better. Right. Um, maybe there's something that will trigger like in the national sort of mindset. Like people, like people across the country. I mean, just recognizing that there's a big problem here and that we're getting too nitpicky and too controlling. I, I just think that. Everything is about control now. Like you, yeah. like people want to, people want to control what other people think. It's like, crazy. It's like somebody put an authoritarian something in the water, and everybody. I see it more in blue states. I have to say, people who have been under lockdown longer seem mm-hmm. to have like had that little mini authoritarian in them triggered. Yeah. Like, I mean, I see this sometimes like with um, just like the mask wearing outside to like, yeah. you know, like if you want to wear one, wear one. If you don't, don't. Like, it's, why do we got to be so upset about it? Like, yeah, I, it doesn't, if you're not near anyone, it's fine. Like, what is like, there's no justification for it for to be like all uptight about it. But on, on Twitter too, like you just, you tweet anything. It can be the most innocuous thing. <laughs> and then people respond in the like most like horrified way about everything. Like, oh, did you say this? Oh, do you, do you mean X, Y, and Z? 
you know, I, I just, it, it's, it's frustrating. By the way, I, I read one time about, or maybe I heard you say it about how whenever you tweet something that makes one side happy, you then tweet something to, yeah. or to, to upsets one side, then you tweet something to upset the other side, just to like, keep it. To keep just my keep it. honest. Yeah. yeah. I've got to yeah. purge the, the following. I know. Cause that, that can happen on Twitter. Uh, but like everyone is out there to tell you what to do, what to think, how to like, how to live your life, what values to hold. And that's really dangerous. It's really problematic. And, and again, I go back to libertarianism and why I, I support it and, and would love for people to join the libertarian party. We're not trying to tell people what values to have. Like mm -hmm. people can decide for themselves. And if you, if you in a small community want to have socialism, go, go ahead. Just don't involve us in it. Like, right. you know, we're like, if, if you want to say like, we're going to go form our own little like social socialist, <laughs> you know, village or something, go for it. I'm not against <laughs> yeah. that. That's, that's fine. And if someone else wants to have a different village with different values, go for it. Like I libertarianism allows for all of these values to flourish mm -hmm. and, and then well, now I know the natural reaction by some will be like, well, what about like when there's like discrimination and like there's a community that just wants to discriminate and, and do all sorts of awful things. And again, this is where libertarians would say we have different levels of government. You've got, you know, you've got your family unit, you've got a neighborhood, you've got local, you've got state, you've got federal. If in our system, we have the 14th Amendment, which gives the federal government power to protect individual rights. So it can, it can intervene to prevent a state from discriminating, to prevent a state from violating due process or, or not um, respecting um, right. equal protection under the law. So we have this system. It's sort of like a negative, it's sort of like a negative power we give higher levels of government. It's not that the federal government is there to, to dictate to a state government how to operate. It's that when the state government decides how to operate, the federal government can come in and say, okay, well, you just can't do it in a discriminatory fashion. Like right. you can, you guys decide how to do it, but you can't do it in a discriminatory fashion. So these kinds of protections are perfectly fine within libertarianism that, because they protect individual rights. Um, right. And ultimately it's not about state states rights or cities rights, or we don't, we never talk about that as, in, as, libertarians it's about individual rights and so mm -hmm. giving a higher level of government uh power to protect individual rights is is all right that's an okay thing to do um, but it's a negative power it's not telling them how to operate it's a power to tell them how they can't operate like you just you can't you know be discriminatory against uh you know someone of a particular race or or whatever it right. might be and and that's okay yeah that's okay and so we can I we can resolve this stuff you can have yeah, you can have a broadly decentralized system with some protections that go all the way to the top, right? And right. and I think that can alleviate some of the concerns people have when they think it's like, well, this means like open discrimination and all that stuff. It, do it doesn't right. mean that. It doesn't mean that. And again, I want to go back to something I said earlier, which is in modern times, because of technology you can report all this stuff so easily compared to before. Like if something is mm -hmm. bad, if you see something wrong, you can tweet about it. And like all of a sudden everyone knows about it. So like, it's not like the local store can just discriminate you against you on the basis of race. And like, nobody's going to find out about it. You just go tweet about it. And everyone knows about it. Right. The, again, a double-edged sword Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. now we have, right. thing, you know, huge stories based on like one person tweeting something. So that again, works in both it directions does. It does. as everything is lately. I always ask the same two questions at the end of my podcast. What is your biggest defect of character? Uh, this is uh, that's, that's good. I didn't know this was coming. Um, I know. I like to surprise people. Um, my biggest defect of character, I would say, is that I'm, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, and <laughs> and this is, uh, I think, a real problem at times because yeah, I have a tendency to move carefully, and sometimes it, it ends up being like too carefully. Like there's, mm. I. I have a concern about like um, just saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. And while that can be a good thing, I think overall it's in many ways a hindrance um, because mm. there are times when 
I can make an impact with what I'm saying or doing, and I hesitate because I want to make sure, like, I've thought through. Does it align with all my principles? Is it like consistent with what I've said before? And a lot of other people just let it fly. And that is a, that can be an advantage and it can, you know, it can be a disadvantage too. So I don't know. It's like, I view it as a defect. What is that quote? Don't let perfection be the enemy, enemy of good or whatever that quote is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can- yeah. That, that can happen. I don't, I mean, when it comes to legislating, I don't like, look, you've got to be careful about legislating because right. you're doing it on behalf of other people. But even in like my own personal life, right. I'm just, I move, I move rather cautiously about things. And that can mean um, sometimes moving too slowly on some things, or maybe sometimes it being interpreted like I'm not caring enough about a particular situation because I'm just like, I'm thinking it through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it can, it can hurt people at times. Yeah. And what's your bi- your biggest asset? Well, I think it's that I try to improve every day. Mm-hmm. I really have like, that's that's a big focus in my life, being better than I was the day before. I try not to make, you know, maybe this is connected to my defect, right? Yeah. But I try not to make the same mistake twice. I I try really hard to just to learn from my mistakes. Uh, these are things that I I don't think everyone does. Like I I do see people at times who just repeat the same mistake over and over, and I wonder <laughs> like I wonder like why didn't they why didn't they learn from that thing? Mm-hmm. But but I do I do try to learn, and um and I'd say that's probably my biggest asset. I'm, I'm willing to take I'm willing to also embrace challenges. Like mm-hmm. I ran for office at a really young age. Mm-hmm. I was willing to do an exploratory committee for president. Th- those challenges, they don't always work out, but they they do open doors, and yeah, and that's important. It's important just to see what happens. A lot of yeah. times, like people, yeah. people don't have enough luck. Just let's see what happens. Yeah, there's not enough of that attitude. I think it's because I feel like the culture is so um, destructive, right? In a destructive phase cycle, and not so much creative. There's a lot of creative energy, but. It feels like the focus is on the destructive energy, even if they're both happening simultaneously, um, which they usually are. But yeah, yeah it, it feels like the the focus is like you know everything is burning down and bad. And I actually, I, I, I'm weirdly optimistic. I see a lot of people thinking, almost coming out of a you know slumber like thinking for themselves really thinking for themselves what are their values what are their first principles what hills will they die on what is not what is important and and these questions are coming out of this kind of chaos and i think that like you said it might be ugly Mm -hmm. (laughs) on the way but it it seems like like you also said the majority of people are reasonable i believe that yeah i believe believe that too I believe that too. And I think, um, I think we don't have enough love for one another and Mm -hmm. respect for one another. And I I think we don't appreciate enough how much our backgrounds shape our views. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a tendency for people to jump to the conclusion that when someone did something, they did it out of a place of malevolence. Like they just, Mm -hmm. oh, that person's you know, has these particular views because they hate so and so, or they're they're right. racist, or they're selfish, or or whatever it might be, or they don't understand freedom, or whatever. You know, they right. like there's, but I I think like just a lot of people they're raised a certain way and right. they get those values growing up. Maybe, maybe it's from yeah. their parents, maybe it's from their community, and those values we could think they're wrong. But the way to address that is not by saying the person is an evil person or like right. a, it's to have a conversation with that person about their values and principles. And yep. and when I say this stuff, sometimes libertarians get mad. And they're like, oh, well, like well, we're going to have a conversation with Lindsey Graham about like or or whoever in government. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, no, I don't mean Lindsey Graham. Like, I mean, yeah. I mean, like your neighbor or like someone you work with or. Right. Or someone you just run into on Twitter who you don't know. Like, stop assuming that it's that they're a bad person just because they disagree with you. Like, yeah, e- even if they yeah. even if they're hostile toward you, show them love and peace to the extent you can. 
I love that. Peace and love. What a great <laughs> right. place to end. I do have one really quick question just for anyone who's interested. What would you say for a libertarian who's just coming, awakening to their libertarianism or wants to l- abandon the the old parties? What is some good reading? Oh, um, like good reading would be, I, I like Hayek. Yep. But again, I think maybe it's, it's not necessarily the place for everyone to start, but Hayek is is a great author, um, a great libertarian thinker, and someone who at times is readable and at times not um, because it's, okay. cause English is not his first language. And I, I think uh-huh. sometimes his sentences go on too long. Mm-hmm. But uh, so F.A. Hayek, I would read The Use of Knowledge in Society, which is one of his okay. essays. I think that's a really good place to start. He also wrote an essay called Why I Am Not a Conservative which I think is okay. is really good. But uh, other than that, um, The Law by Frederick Bastiat, you know, mm-hmm. he's French, he's not uh, American, but it's worth a read. Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And, um, and I think some of the work by Nassim Taleb actually related to, especially related to localism, uh, has a very sort of Hayekian, you know, like Hayek approach to it. And I think that that can be really useful for libertarians because because there's a he's increasingly focused on localism, which I think is really right. important. Great. Well, where can we find you? You can find me at Justin Amash. Most places. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Clubhouse. That's probably the those are probably the two places where you'll find me most often. Okay. I have an Instagram too, but mostly I post photos that I've. I actually, that's all I do is I post photos that I've taken. It's not really political, so. Um, yeah. That's why, like, if some people look at it and it's it's like a private Instagram, that's why it's because it's just like my, yeah. it's just like photos <laughs> I take. It's not even photos of, yeah. it's not photos of me. It's like photos of the world. Yeah, that yeah. I, take. I like that. So if you want to see it's lots a, of, like, it's a nice place. Yeah, if you want to see lots <laughs> of like pictures of Orthodox churches and things like that, like, yeah, <laughs> like that's the place to be. Well, I'm sure we'll be having another conversation in the future. This is a this is a good starting point for us. Yeah, <laughs> to, I hope so. Be. I hope so, and I'm. I'm happy to come on anytime, talk about any topic. Like I have a wide array of interests. So like whatever you want to talk about, you want to talk about space or dinosaurs or like Star Trek. Like <laughs> It's never long enough. It's like I, I, I'm i trying to keep them, you know, I'm very respectful of people's time and I try to keep them right around what I say. And I, it's like I just, I understand why Rogan's go for hours because I feel like I'm just starting to scratch the surface because I also want to know you know, what you're up to now and what gives your life meaning yeah. and all, no, I know, think that like, stuff is what great. Are, how do you stay sane in this? And, and so, yeah, we'll have to have a part yeah. two and, um, we'll, we'll, this is good though. I think for, we'll let the, we'll let the people digest this and then we'll, <laughs> we'll give them another bite-sized morsel. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. This is just, it's given me a lot to think about. Yeah. Thanks Bridget. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. We're recording. We're recording? Yes. What shall we talk about? I was just talking about how the live streams make me feel alive. (laughs) There's no editing. There's. It's like radio. It's just pure unfiltered Bridget. (laughs) It's just purely I can say anything and get canceled at any minute. There's no ability for... Censor China Maggie Censor to step China in. China Maggie to stop me. This is a free for all. No, we were just talking about how it's already the end of the second quarter. That's crazy. And I was asking Maggie about how she was doing on her second quarter goals. <laughs> I was like, I don't even remember what my goals were. <laughs> do you make goals regularly? How do you do your goals? I and, or do you call them intentions? I'm haphazard about it. I definitely wrote some down this year, at the beginning of the year, and then. Uh, but I really, obviously, as you can tell, I haven't checked in on them lately because I don't even remember what they were, <laughs> <laughs> which is part of the hazard of just getting swept away by life. But um, yes, I should go back and look and do and do a check in, a self check in. I was just thinking about it today before I came over about how, you know, a couple of weeks ago we did that one where uh, we were both talking about what losers we felt like. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I do feel better because I feel like I've gotten a bunch of stuff, you know, checked off my list that I was just letting pile up. So I still have stuff to do, but I knocked a bunch of items off my list, which makes me feel better about my life. 
Yeah, that doesn't work for me. Really? No, because for me, feeling like a loser is not when I'm not doing things. It generally comes from I'm comparing myself to other people or feeling like I should be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I feel better, but it's because I've just been, I recentered myself in, in my 12 step program. So I put that in the center of my life, which mm -hmm. automatically puts God or whatever that sense of you are exactly where you should be. Also, it automatically forces you to be more of service. So, like I said that day, the only antidote for me is God, service, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I, and really just not looking, keeping my eye on my own paper. Generally, when I'm looking outward, it's because I'm not doing something that I should be doing. Right. Writing a book, writing, you know, it's, I'm focused at getting on stage. It's, it's something, it's a way for me to, it's that kind of comparing or envy or jealousy is really just revealing to me what my soul is asking to be doing that mm -hmm. I'm not doing. It might be the hard thing. Mm -hmm. Have you seen Hacks yet on HBO? No. It's so good. It's a half hour. It is, I can see, I was seeing a lot of the older women comics that I follow on Twitter just loving the show. And it's such a good, the way that they do it where it's a younger 25 year old Gen Z and this older woman who's been in comedy and is a residency in Vegas and their conflict and not only just between who they are as people, but just the generational conflict. Uh -huh. And it's so good. Wow, well, okay. It is, it's so well done. It's funny, but it also has made me emotional. But it made me think of just the work ethic of this older woman versus this younger woman who kind of got her jobs because she was big on Twitter and didn't have to work very hard. And uh -huh. I I just was like, I'm not working hard enough. It shows me where I'm lazy because things can come easily to me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in certain areas. It, it's kind of, for me, it's, I mean, obviously I'm not public the way you are and as a public persona out there, but I, I noticed that it becomes a vicious circle for me where I've, if I've got a bunch of stuff I need to do and then I don't do it, and then I let it pile up even more, and I start to avoid it, and it's bringing all this stress to my life where I'm like, if I just fucking tackled a few of these items, I would start to feel better, and then it's easier to tackle a bunch more, but it's it's this weird pattern of, it's definitely linked to depression, where I, mm. where if I notice it and, and starting to like pile up, I, I'm, I'm aware it's one of my kind of like warning signs. Interesting. Because when I'm like when I was super depressed, like you just can't do anything, and yeah. then you're just lying there and feeling like a complete loser and being like, "What's wrong with me?" And yeah. So yes, so I have noticed uh, just even in work, if there's certain I like uh, things that I just really don't want to do, and then they build up and build up, and then I'm letting them sit there, and then I'm like, "Okay, just roll up your sleeves and do it." it always just makes it so much easier. I'm like, what is the problem here? Why? <laughs> if I know this, like, why? <laughs> I get it. For me, it's stupid shit. Like, I got some residual checks from Curb Your Enthusiasm, which, by the way, all these people in Hollywood must be so fucking rich. Uh -huh. Because I was there for two seconds and had one line, and it was... It was like not that much, uh -huh. but because it's SAG and there were international revenues, it's like a, a couple of hundred, more than a couple, several hundred dollars. Wow. And I was like, what the? These guys, went, imagine and imagine if you're an executive producer or creator, like they must be so fucking rich. I know. A. The money. I came here for that sweet TV money and I am not leaving <laughs> until I make it. And so, but then some of the checks are like classic residual checks, right, most of like them. three cents. It's like one, a dollar 29 uh -huh. uh, for a role like mine and that in, in Curb. And I was just laughing at how I will procrastinate in depositing those checks. Mm -hmm. Part of it comes from a weird scarcity mentality yep. where I know that if I have checks to cash, I have 
backup money. Backup yeah, money. It's like my savings. I know. You <laughs> you've done it for that way for a really long time. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't invoice for a bunch of columns because you knew like, oh, I have that money in reserve. Right. It's like a savings. I'm like, well, if yeah. somebody owes me twelve hundred dollars, that's my savings. Right. Yeah, that's a weird residual from living hand to mouth and being super poor for a really long time. And it's a hard habit to break, but it's also just, it will take me all of five minutes. Yeah. And it's something so stupid. And I just, I mean, to the point that my husband is like, can I please just deposit that? He's like, you know, you can do this like online. I you don't know. even have to go to the bank. There's an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just like, I'll do it for you. Just sign the checks. And I can't even sign the checks. <laughs> it's just so stupid. So for me, it's stupid little crap like that. Although I have to say my life is much more. I'm much more on top of my life. And in general, I err towards the opposite of you where I will go psycho and I won't be able to stop doing things. Mm -hmm. So it will just become almost compulsive. Like I'll just start purging because I'm always procrastinating on writing Mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The book. Well, I've learned too to, to like, roll with my highs and lows in terms Mm -hmm. of like if I'm on a roll with something and I'm in like get shit done mode get as much shit done as possible yeah get ahead on the podcast get like get that clean done do that organization project that I've been meaning to do like get a bunch of work done like all if I'm on a roll with something I tend to just try and push as as far as I can go because that way when I when I'm not on a roll I'm kind of like okay you know I'm still okay like I'm caught up it, yeah it's, it's we it's a weird kind of acceleration deceleration but I, I've kind of learned to capitalize best when I'm in in that like it's I wouldn't it's not like so far as you know a mania phase or anything <laughs> like that <laughs> because, your but, mania would be very chill yeah exactly <laughs> but I know that if chill I'm like, mania if I'm cruising along <laughs> yeah that's a great band name <laughs> That will be our spinoff podcast, <laughs> Chill Mania. You're the chill and I'm the mania. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I've learned, I'm, I, I don't know, just figuring yourself out and then learning what works for you and, and how you how you tick and how best to get the most out of yourself. It's yeah. An interesting I, process. I generally strive for me now, and this is, this is also a product of living with Jaron, who is like, missed his calling as a person who belongs in an army or something (laughs) because he's so good at being Uh self-disciplined and I, I am not, I'm totally. And it's, it's funny. We were joking about how it's so much like you can really look at what our drugs of choice were Uh and he was a tweaker and I was like a junkie and I'm like, yeah, I'm such the like disorganized creative junkie right and he's such the like hyper manic um tweaker tweaker who needs he's like i'm a tweaker i'll Uh just like get into it Uh build like six shelves in one afternoon because he just gets he he gets in that zone uh and kind of tweaks out on things and i don't know how you know he looks at my phone and he's like a zero inbox person yeah and i am not that person at all and he looks at my digital clutter he's like looks at my He's like you. and It's funny. I'm surrounded by so many people who are hyper organized <laughs> because I don't even he looks at me and he's like, I don't even know how this doesn't drive you. Your insane. desktop is insane. Usually I ha- can't see it right now. But. Oh, no, I have. Look at how many I have 20 documents open that are just on the bottom. But then I also have another 20 open here and I'm always rotating between uh-huh, all of them. Uh-huh. And it's just how ha- I've tried so many other systems and I'm like, no, it doesn't work. I just need to make sure I stay on top of it every week. And so now I'm better about at least every couple of weeks cleaning up my desktop and organizing and throwing things away. I'm getting better at the digital stuff, like how I was saying I had to put all the files in the folder from the last podcast. Right, right. Because I would wait and then I'd be searching for them and I don't delete anything from my inbox, really. Yeah. <laughs> and 
I tend not to, no, see, I'm not a zero inbox person. I try to be a zero like unread message person. Mm. So I, I really don't, I, if I, I used to be really good about labeling and putting all my emails in folders. I don't really do that anymore because it's so easy to search through your history and be like, oh, what, what was this? Unless something specific that I need to label. I don't mind having stuff in my inbox. It's the unread stuff mm. that I'm like, I try and keep my, my flags down yeah. to, to a minimum. Yeah, I had a woman who worked at the Genius Bar who said that people who organize their emails and files are wasting time and they're not using the processing power of the computer. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, I don't organize anything. She's like, well, that's smart because you can just search for it. Right. I just try and make (laughs) sure my, you know, subject heading of emails, which we learned a long time ago, (laughs) are, are, you know, what the email's about. And then that way... (laughs) <laughs> we, we used to send each other emails to be like, hey, that was like the subject. And we were finally like, oh, if we write the title of what this is actually about in the email, it's a lot more easy to go back. But um, I, no, I've got a big project that I'm working on just at work. There's my, you know, kind of pitch was dial it in this year. Mm-hmm. Like, let's get everything organized and digitally organized and all sorts of stuff. And I've got to go through my dropbox file of all the shit that i deal with and just organize it all because it's some of it's super old and i can get rid of it and so i'm just kind of I'm trying to work my way through that process i actually really enjoy that kind of thing i i don't enjoy it at all i find it to be like a massive waste of my time mm-hmm. but i and i wish this is when i do wish i had this is you like need some kind who, of assistant who yeah. just literally sat in front of my computer but then i wouldn't be able to find anything right and i i do need I, I'm just, I'm disorganized. That was a really hard thing to to face. It's funny though, too, because I think about how I was, I'm exactly the same way I was when I was nine and 10 years old. And I would go into the school year and I was super organized and I was like determined to be the organized child who had all their folders and their their papers in the right folder with the right subjects. And inevitably it was like every single assignment just ended up in one folder and everything is always priority like what needs to get done for it's just whatever is the top priority needs to get done Uh uh-huh yeah and that's the way your brain sorts it (laughs) and it's still the way my brain sorts it it's why i'm like i'm super glad that this person wants my book proposal like tonight basically because I'm like, oh, I'll actually finish that. Right. You need deadlines <laughs> always and forever. You need a hard deadline. It's like, oh, all right. I suppose I can do that. Otherwise, we wouldn't see your book for another 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> we still might not, by the way. <laughs> this is going to become like, an I ongoing make no joke. Promises. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's currently writing her book. They were trolling me in my live stream today because locals <laughs> launched live stream, which is awesome. And I've never really used live stream, which is weird because it seems like it would suit me well. Uh-huh. And and they were trolling me about, oh, you're writing a book. Uh-huh. I'm like, I see your comments in the I chat. I see you. I see you mocking me. <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> mockery is one of the most motivating ways to get me to do anything i know that's directly from our family it really is it really is how we all reverse psychology handle each other well you're gonna do yeah so i i don't know i was looking at my goals and I have one of those passion planners, which I like because every month you kind of take stock of where you are. Mm-hmm. And we do goals in the Phetasy community, and mm-hmm. I I should go back and look at what mine were. Oh, I just recently did them, and yeah, so I'll I'll check back in. But some of the stuff I have no control over, you know, in terms of like I'd like to have X amount of subscribers on YouTube, but that's completely out of my hands. Right. The only thing you control with that is continually cranking out content right and that's really the only thing i can control with any of it Mm -hmm. i can't control how it's i can push for more subscribers but honestly i hate even doing that i know and i know that it's not a great business move but i don't want to you know somebody was saying oh you could just say like hey i'm being suppressed or like hey i'm gonna be banned or hey people are piling on me whenever People right. do or they attack me like they have been this past week for my bold stance on the Olympian athlete that's a trans woman. 
And um, I don't want to do that. No, it, it, It's the victimhood mentality that you rail against. But I just want people to come join because they want to come join and want to support. Right. I don't want to be bullying people into or just even... I don't know. I it's, kind of like that it's a, a, it feels like a bit of a secret community too. Right, right. And I I agree where it's just like if people want to support, they're familiar enough now with the subscriber model and the fact that on YouTube, if you click subscribe or like or the notification bell, it helps. You know, yeah. like they know that. Yes, d- should they be reminded about it? Sure, but you're not going to like go go around begging people to sign up. If they want to, they will. I know, and it's uh, people say you have to remind everybody constantly, and I know you, I know you're you have to be reminding people that you exist constantly, and I know I understand that, but it's just not so. Some of those goals, more my goals that were personal, I got a new sponsor, which is great. I needed that. I was not really. I felt myself drifting from twelve step. And uh-huh. it's dangerous for me in in advance of the summer, uh-huh. particularly July. July. And I can't think that I'm just out of the woods ever. Right. I had a dream the other night I was doing blow. Ugh. Ugh. Uh. It was so anxiety provoking. I had a dream once that I was drinking with you and I freaked out. And I was like, oh my God, Bridget's off the wagon and it's my fault. <laughs> and then I think that my writing goals, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like some of it's... Like, I really want to get Dumpster Fire up as a podcast, but that's just a bandwidth thing. But maybe in one of these weeks off we have, that's just our project. I know it'll get done. Yeah. Just keep going. Just keep going. The summer of the one that got away and just keep going. And chill mania. (laughs) I like that. chill mania. (laughs) Yeah, I do know that I when I have to chill, too. Like, last night I knew I could have done a million things, and I was like, go... And I now have this bad habit of binge watching an entire series just in one sitting. Yeah, that's common. I know. It's just bad. I can't stop myself. And I know know that it's ended. And I really wanted to see Hacks. And I thought I'd be able to stop myself. And then it's only a half hour, especially if it's like a half hour show. I'm Mm -hmm. like, oh, I can bang this out in like four hours, Mm -hmm. which I did. And... It was so good, and I'm glad I watched it. And it just, I'm, I went to a museum. I've been really on top of my. You have to feed your my adult summer camp. Soul. Going to a museum was actually moving. I started crying when I stood in front of a painting and looked at actual brush sp- strokes in analog. Mm. Seeing, just being around people talking about art and being in that the. The space is so gorgeous, and it was it's um it's contemporary art. So I was kind of like, because I always want to like kill myself with mo- modern art makes me like violent. Uh-huh. But it's the contemporary artists that I really love. Uh-huh. So it was Warhol and all of the guys that some of the most famous. I mean, this is one. It's the Broad, and it's just one person's collection, which is beyond crazy to me. Wow. Yeah, and like. Uh, Coons's work who's weird and Basquiat's Uh and Uh yeah it was just so nice to be in a museum and I realized how much I missed the need to have that time to just look at art and process it and and seeing things in analog not virtually Mm -hmm. that was like the thing that struck me was the the tangibility of those brush strokes it was good I'm really committed to my summer camp, my adult summer camp. Nice. So we'll check in. It's the halfway point. Yeah. Although the year is over. The rest, of, yeah. <laughs> no, the rest of the year is gone. It's gone. And it's, and it's gone. gone. But no, I want to enjoy the summer and go to the beach. And I'm not doing anything in July or mm-hmm. going away. Mm-hmm. I think we just go to the beach and enjoy it. Keep, you know, keep the plates spinning. Yep. And maybe try and fig- get some of the things we need to catch up on, like, get the dumpster fire podcast going and then look for new projects to start in the fall. Cause we don't have enough going on. <laughs> Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie and all of you out there listening. This has been walk-ins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy. And you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)